An ancient Roman author wrote, the largest part of the journey is the passing of the gate. Hello, I'm Joe Grasmick, and for decades, all I've done is help Canadians cross the border or open that metaphorical gate to the US market. This short 30 minute video is for any Canadian business with US ties. The topic is getting across the border, immigration. Immigration is essential for cross-border business and it's usually the first thing that comes up. What it's about is getting your body across the border. Many things are tough to handle from a distance. Visiting distributors or customers, getting paperwork such as leases, incorporation documents and business licenses, arranging financing, etc. Many of my clients' U.S. startups were triggered by that crucial first U.S. customer. And you don't want to have to call someday and say you're stuck at the border and won't show up for that meeting. You can hardly even export a product if you're not able to visit your customers from time to time. Two forces make immigration rule compliance more important. One, the 9-11 crackdowns and the blank check for border security. Just take the number of agents alone. Since 9-11, the number of northern border officers, that's Canada, US, has increased 650% from 340 in 2001 to um, two to 3,000 today. Another force that makes uh, immigration rule compliance uh, more crucial now is that U.S. long-term unemployment is the highest since the Great Depression. It's almost double that of Canada. Not that many people know that. Double the long-term unemployment. There's a border urge to protect American labor markets. Even though you folks listening to this create trade and therefore U.S. jobs. Nevertheless, you've got those two things that you're going against. Immigration can also get confusing. It may help to understand that the immigration world has three categories. One, temporary non-immigrants. Two, permanent immigrants, permanent residents, landed immigrants. Number three, citizens. It's more or less the same structure in Canada and, and other countries. So almost three-fourths of the non-citizens, in other words, those first three groups, almost three-fourths are in that first group, the non-immigrants. That probably includes you and millions of Canadian retirees, visitors, and business people. Tens of thousands of other temporary non-immigrants are on various temporary work permits. Today, we're going to talk about a few of the non-immigrant ways to get across the border. So I hope that puts it into context. We're talking about that first group, both work permitted and not permitted, temporary entries. One way to get across the border is just cross the border as always. Most Canadians coming to the U.S. do that. They use the quick and easy B1 permit. That's B as in boy, one permit. Although B1s are limited in what they can do, it's all most of you listening to this will ever need. You're probably all familiar with the B1, if not by name. If you're Canadian and if you said at the border, I'm coming for a seminar or a meeting, you are here on B1 status. You don't have a paper proving it, but you need to follow the B1 rules while you are in the US. What are the B1 rules? I wish I got a dime every time someone says, I won't have any problems. I'm getting paid from Canada. Well, compensation from Canada is a necessary but not sufficient condition of B1 status. What that means is, if you um, can follow the Boolean logic there, you can't get paid from the US and be here on B1 status. But just because you're paid from Canada doesn't mean you're off the hook. There are other rules. So it's a good thing to keep all the requirements in mind. 
You don't know what questions they're going to ask at the border, but this background knowledge will help you say the right thing, truthfully, of course, to the inspector. Now, I mean it when I say truthfully, because fraud is a permanent bar from ever entering the United States for any purpose whatsoever, not even lunch in Buffalo or to Disneyland. Tell the truth, it's not worth it. Here are the requirements. Now, when I say requirements here and in the other things, they're like kind of like my requirements, the real ones, how it really works. I mean, you'll see lists and regulation requirements uh, and things taken out of context. Uh, I'm just saying this is what is for real. Four requirements. Number one, you must leave the U. I'll go through them quickly. Why don't I go through them quickly and then spend some time on each one? Number one, leave the U.S. when business ends. Number two, serve a non-U.S. employer. Number three, no money from the U.S. And number four, job duties must be of acceptable B1 nature. First of all, must leave the U.S. when your business ends. The entry must be temporary. You can make lots of entries, but this particular entry needs to be temporary, no longer than six months, in some cases 12 months under the free trade agreement. Second requirement to maintain B-1 status. You must serve a non-U.S. employer. The B-1 visitor for business must perform services for a foreign company. When I use the word foreign, I'm doing it from the perspective of being in the United States where I actually am right now, walking distance to the Peace Bridge in Buffalo, Fort Erie. Uh, so, you must serve a non-U.S. employer. Uh, you must perform services for a foreign company, in other words, a company outside of the United States, Canada. For example, a salesperson can solicit orders for a Canadian company. He or she could also make a market study regarding future business in the U.S. The B-1 visitor should not actively manage operations of a U.S. company. A lot of people say, oh, I'm so, I, I don't work. I just manage. Well, management is work. For example, if you're selling something, that may be fine. But if you're coming here to manage an ongoing distributorship network, they may not let you in. Immigration can let you in to manage company startup operations. In this case, there's a safe harbor. If you show that you've not yet set up your U.S. company, you don't have physical presence, and immigration rules specifically allow people who would eventually qualify as an L1 transferee or e-visa investors or traders into the U.S. under B-1 status to set things up. That was a mouthful. In your case, an earful. So, I will repeat that. If you would eventually qualify as an L1 intercompany transferee or an E-treaty investor or trader into the U.S., you can come to set things up. We'll talk more about L's and E's later, but keep that in mind since we're talking about B's right now. It's a vicious cycle, you know, if you, you wouldn't be allowed to come in. You know, I need to have the business set up so as to qualify for an L or an E, but you won't let me in to set it up. So to break that cycle, they have those safe harbors. Okay, we hit two B-1 requirements, leave the U.S. when business ends and serve a non-U.S. employer. A third one, no money from the U.S. The source of payment for services and expenses of a B-1 business person in the U.S. should come from outside the country. There's some exceptions, sometimes they allow you in, sometimes some accept, you know, it. but the best way is don't get any payment from the U.S. The B-1 business visitor cannot receive salary or payment in any form from a U.S. source. Avoid commissions tied to U.S. work if you can. Ideally, the Canadian company should issue payment in Canadian funds drawn on a Canadian bank. You'll see a theme through all these requirements, besides the international commerce one coming up, is lots of links to Canada, not minimal links to the U.S. So the fourth, job duties must be of acceptable B-1 nature. Fourth requirement uh, to get in on B-1 status and to be legal here while you're on B-1 status. The B-1 visitor for business cannot perform productive tasks that local U.S. workers usually do. They call this local labor for hire. No local labor for hire. 
This is hard to define. It might depend on the judgment of the officer at the port of entry. I mean, I've heard, he told me that this is something his brother-in-law could do, so he's not letting me in. You know, it's not very scientific, but uh, you can see there's a wide discretion on what's lo what is local labor for hire. That reminds me of the Supreme Court definition of pornography, where a justice said, I'll know it when I see it. A rule of thumb, the more what you are doing looks like international commerce, the better. International commerce is the exchange of goods across the border, including computer software. So we talked about four, the four um, requirements to, for B1 status. There are certain safe harbors, since a lot of that can be a little murky, one safe harbor is the after sales service B1. That's enshrined in the regulations and in NAFTA. It's valuable, it's underused. And it's nice because folks coming in under this B1 after sales service safe harbor can actually look like they're doing work. You can have work clothes on, you can be dirty, you can have uh, uh, whatever, your tools with you. Um, you can come in with a, a van full of tools. Uh, it's very nice. But there are some requirements. It encompasses installers, repair and maintenance personnel, trainers, and supervisors. The only exception to that is if you're in the construction industry, only supervisors can come in. But that's pretty broad, isn't it? installers, repair and maintenance personnel, trainers and supervisors. Uh, these people must have specialized knowledge. Actually, three requirements again. Number one, the people coming in, whether it's you that are, that's going to be coming in or your employer has to keep this in mind if they're sending you across. Uh, special, you have to have specialized knowledge. The services need to be required by a warranty or contract for the sale of equipment or machinery purchased from outside the country. Again, that could include computer software. So you have to specialized knowledge required by warranty or contract and for the sale of equipment or machinery. That again, get the international commerce. It's to help goods cross the border. So we talked about four requirements plus a safe harbor in the B1. How do you get one in the first place? Well, there's three ways to get the B1. One way that most people use is the smile and a wave method. You go to the border, either the kiosk where you're driving through your, with your car or the desk at the airport, and you state the purpose of your trip. Maybe there's some cursory questions. You're waved through and you're in. You have no paperwork proving you're in or proving you've got B1 status. Sometimes they will stamp your passport, but that's the way most Canadians come in the United States on B1 status. Second way, the official looking letter method. You take a letter on your company letterhead explaining the purpose of your travel. Have somebody else sign it, don't sign it yourself. Show it to the inspector if the inspector scrutinizes your entry. Don't just wave the letter and say, I hereby demand to be let in your country. But, you know, if the smile and the wave is getting a little thin, then it's nice to have the letter. And that will also prepare you mentally. Um, it's kind of like Murphy's Law with that letter. Um, when I prepare one for a client or tell them to do one, nobody ever asks them for it. But when they don't have it, they would have liked it. The third way to get B1 status is to arrange for a multiple entry, another mouthful, hang on, it'll make sense. Arrange for a multiple entry I-94 arrival and departure rec record. That's proof that an immigration officer at a port of entry examined you and found you eligible for business visitor status. What's an I-94? I-94 is a little piece of paper and it's usually used to document somebody, a Canadian's or a Canadian's work status, or it's used pe people that need passport visas from other countries. It's a, um, 
an entry document stapled into your passport, a little white piece of paper. Uh, many of you probably know what that is. Anyway, that I-94 should make subsequent entries easier because you've already proven your case once to a supervisor. Uh, you want to save that as maybe a last resort because it raises an awful lot of questions. It's why are you asking for this? Uh, so know that it's in your arsenal, uh, but the other, all things being equal, the other two methods, smile and a wave, official looking letter, uh, are probably better advised. Now, what do you do when the smile and a wave wears thin, the official looking letter doesn't work, and they don't even want to hear your story for an I-94? Travel with a work permit. It's our second major topic in this short video. Number one was you're traveling without a work permit as a temporary visitor for business B1. Now number two, travel with a work permit. When do you need a work permit? How do you know if you need one or not? Usually folks who call me just know. The border guard scrutinizes their entries. I'm going to a meeting becomes, what kind of meeting? Worse yet, you're pulled over for secondary inspection to go inside or at another counter to tell your story to a supervisor. And this can take a while. Two to five hours is common for secondary inspection. Your air, the, the airplane's not going to wait for you, and the megabus will only for, wait for, for a certain period of time, too. So it's something you want to avoid, and it's a wake-up call. Another way, before any of that happens, is to do your research right now. I mean right now, right now when you're sitting in front of this video. Just do this little drill with me. Uh, ask yourself, where, do, what, where does what I do fit in what Joe's three categories are, the three categories Joe is going to give me right now? Number one, see if you fit in one, two, or three. Number one, you do stuff in the U.S. that's clearly permitted under B1. For example, you export product only to the U.S. or import product from the U.S. Or do you fit into number two? You're getting into gray areas. For example, you export and import, but maybe you're starting a distribution network. Or maybe you're doing lectures and you're getting paid an honorarium, and maybe you do a little training with individual clients, whatever. Uh, you're into a gray area where they may or may not let you in. Or number three, you really feel your activities are not allowed. Like, say you have manufacturing operations, or you're paid on a a 1099 or a W-2 basis from a U.S. source. Well, if you are in the last two areas, get a work permit. Which work permit is yours? Work permits are letters of the alphabet, and the U.S. government has used almost all the alphabet. Not only that, the letters are divided into hyphen one, hyphen two, hyphen three, hyphen fours. So we have an awful lot of work permits. So I won't talk about all of them. Except for the E, they're not technically visas, but you'll hear me use that word. A visa, technically a visa is a passport stamp, and Canadians don't need that uh, except for a few exceptions, uh, like the E, which we'll talk about, and the uh, one of the K visas. But you may hear the word used throughout. I'll use it interchangeably. It means work permit, status, visa, it's all the same in this, in this little talk. So four of the usual suspects. Incidentally, on my website, I've got web pages on all this, um, and it's been my website's been. I was the first lawyer in um, uh, Western New York, first immigration lawyer in upstate New York to have a website. Uh, so it's pretty. Uh, it's stood the test of time. It's grassmic.com. Uh, it's my last name: G R A S is in Sam, M is in Mary, I C K. So I invite you to get supplemental information either now or after this video. So four of the usual suspects are the H-1B professional worker, the TN free trade professional, the L-1 intra-company transferee, and the E-visas, 
There's the E2 treaty investor and the E1 treaty trader. So I, I will talk a bit about the last three, the TN, the L, and the E, since they give Canadians special treatment. And that's what this video is all about. This is for Canadians. I will not talk about the H1B since there's a ton of information out there about it and it has no special treat for Canadians. So, the special opportunities for Canadians, three of them. The TN at the border, the L1 at the border, and the E treaty investor or treaty trader visa at the U.S. consulate. First, the TN. NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and before that, the CFTA, the Canada Free Trade Agreement, gave and gives Canadians a quick and special status. You can get this TN, and remember that TN, most, most of the time, the letters don't stand for anything, for the visas, for the temporary visas, but the TN stands for Trade NAFTA. It's an easy way to remember. You can get this TN work permit with no application form, within minutes of arriving at a port of entry. Uh, the TN is now good for three years at a shot with no automatic top cap on the total number of years you can be on TN status. And they put it right on one of those little I-94 forms, the ones that I was talking about that in some rare cases you could put, use it for your B1 and you can use that for multiple entries and you just flash that card. Most, most people who have had trouble on TN or trouble entering on B1 status, once they get the TN, they find that the troubles miraculously disappear and everything's smooth as silk. To qualify for a TN uh, free trade professional permit, you must be coming to the U.S. to work in one of the professions listed in the NAFTA agreement. And there's a ton of them. And most of the professions require a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree. Now that NAFTA list can be confusing. I've had people call me and say, uh, what else do I qualify for? I don't qualify for a TN because I, I'm not on the list. Well, it's because it, it was put on another name. It was their profession subsumed under another category. It's uh, a multi-worded uh, profession and they use the word that you didn't think of first when they're alphabetizing it. So do yourself a favor, look at my list. <laughs> Again, since 1995, it stood the test of time. Um, I've you know, corrected it to make it more and more intuitive, go to my TN page. And you can see that link. Uh, all my web pages are listed on the left-hand side of all my web pages. So once you get on my site, you can hit that TN link. And again, it's grasmic.com. A higher than average number of you listening to this we'll be using the TN management consultant category. Why? That's because there's more flexibility. First of all, in the job description, management consultant can cover a number of in industries in another of substantive areas of expertise. And in the academics, you can get a TN management consultant permit without one single semester hour of education. You wouldn't even have to ha have a high school diploma. Just remember though, most TN management consultant denials would not have happened had the applicant remembered two things. It's one of those things that sounds so simple. One, a TN management consultant advises, you advise, you do not do, about two, management issues not technical issues. So you need to be advising. You can't be doing, you can't be managing, you can't be an exec vice president, you can't um, do stuff hands-on, you cannot be in, in the normal reporting line. You need to be outside that. You're coming in, a management consultant is like a hired gun. You, you have this job to do, it's a problem to solve, you come in, you do it, you, you study, you make your recommendations, maybe you stick around a while while it's being implemented and you get out. And not on te you're not advising somebody on their technical issues. I mean, there's, sometimes there's over, 
you know, there's interplay, but you're coming into advice on management issues. The more general, the better. Um, so the second special opportunity for Canadians is getting an L1 at the border. Now remember in the context of this, we're talking about work permits. And we've talked about um, first the TN, and now we're talking about the L1. The L1 is called the intercompany transferee. Don't get put off, please, by the word transferee. I mean, people say, I, I do not qualify for the L1. I didn't even look at it. And I've had a lot of grief because I'm not transferring to the U.S. Well, that's the name, intercompany transferee, which reflects an international corporate structure. But what it means is you're coming to the U.S. either for one day a year or 365 days a year. You can commute. You can split your time. You can come seasonally. You can come intermittently. Um, but the idea is you're coming in the United States to fulfill four requirements. Number one, the Canadian company is related to the U.S. company by ownership, an affiliate, subsidiary, or division. You have a Canadian entity and a U.S. entity. And remember, a division doesn't have to be a separately incorporated entity in the United States. A lot of times your accountants will want to do that or your, or your general business lawyers, but you need uh, two, two entities, and it, uh, one can be a division of the other, common ownership and control. Number two, second L1 requirement, the Canadian company, or you could have a UK company, uh, and you can be Canadian, must continue ongoing operations outside the US. You always need to have the two businesses going on. Number three, the employee, or yourself, if, if, it's, if it's you we're talking about, must have held an executive managerial position or specialized knowledge job with the foreign company for one year within the three years immediately preceding the application. So one year tenure with the foreign company. Fourth requirement, the employee must be doing that kind of stuff in the U.S. It doesn't have to match, it doesn't have to be an executive coming down to be an executive or a manager coming down to be a manager. You need to be, have done one of those things one year in the past three years, and you need to be coming down to the United States to be doing one of those three things. So we talked about the 4L1 requirements. Let's go into another work permit, the E2 Treaty Investor. There's also the E1 Treaty Trader. The E2 Treaty Investor is for substantial investment in the U.S. The E1 is for substantial trade with the U.S. Now, Canadians are kind of special with the E2. They're really special with the TN. Uh, but with the E2, they're kind of special in that citizens of only certain countries can get these visas. But Canada is not alone on the list. There are a number of, of countries uh, whose citizens qualify for ease. It's established through a treaty. They used to be called treaties of friendship, commerce, and trade, but treaties with uh, immigration provisions. Now, the e-visas, in my opinion, are less useful because you cannot get them right at the border. You need to apply to the U.S. consulate in Canada. It can take months. It can, take, it can involve frustrating paperwork and a personal interview. Um, and you can have document ping pong. You send a ream of documents, they send a request back for another ream, you send another ream, they say, oh, by the way, we forgot this, or you just, in that second ream, you brought up an issue, so we want a third ream. A ream for, <laughs> definition of a ream for our paperless, uh, the way our paperless uh, audience is going is not that much paper. <laughs> so. You know, the Canadians are famous for the wide discretion that they wield, and results can be hard to predict, so that may not be your best choice. Once you get it, though, it's very nice. It's a five-year passport stamp, and you can get another five years, and another five years. We used to say that's the next best thing to permanent residence. The next best thing to your green card is an E. Now, just focusing on E2 a bit, 
uh, briefly, the main threshold requirement is that you or your company have substantial Canada-US trade or you're actively making a substantial investment. How much is substantial? Well, there's no set amount. There's some fuzzy formulas on the State Department website, but again, discretion reigns in the US consulate. Now we're getting to the end, end here. I want to keep as close to 30 minutes as possible. Uh, I do tell people when they say how much and keep, they keep pressing me and I say, okay, look, here's a really quick and dirty rule of thumb. And it's, I'm just, it's just a gut feeling. It's not written anywhere. But if you're going to invest a million dollars, I can almost hear the whoosh of the wind going past my ear as the consular officer reaches for that approval stamp. If it's between 250,000 and a million, well, you got a good chance. If it's under 250,000, you've got an uphill battle. Again, really quick and dirty. So that talks about the work permits. And before we end, I just want to mention that you know, assume there's 20 people out there listening right now at this point. Well, one out of one out of your group will have a possible claim to U.S. citizenship based on an ancestor that you want to check out. You know, this uh, talk I've given it 50 to 100 times for you know seminars sponsored by the Canadian consulate and uh, Canadian and provincial and federal agencies, even U.S. agencies. So there's usually a live audience and I ask people to raise their hand. And sure enough, without exception, when there's been 20 people, I've seen one hand. When there's been 40 people, I've seen two hands, etc. So take a look at the citizens link on my website, grasmic.com, G-R-A-S-M-I-C-K, the citizens link. And there's a table in there that took me a long time to put together. It's absolutely the only thing I was never able to delegate even part of to other lawyers in my office um, because it is just so complicated. Uh, but it presents in a very simple way. So you can see if you had an ancestor, even a grandparent, check it out. Even if you had a grandparent, sometimes citizenship can pass. And even if your mother or your grandmother said, you know, I had U.S. citizen but gave it up. You just can't give it up that easy. So check that out, the citizens link. If you have an ancestor um, that um, has a possible claim to U.S. citizenship, or even if you heard that they lived in the United States for a while, um, check it out. Now this information should take care of 90% of you. Um, as per that Roman writer, Marcus Terentius Varro, um, your gate is open. Um, you can be prosperous, taking into account the U.S. market and know that physically you can come across and do business. If you're in that 10% with unanswered questions, I'll be happy to talk to you on the phone and give you an answer. Uh, you can set up a telephone consultation with me. It's item number one on my homepage. It only takes a minute or two to set up. You can set that up 24 hours a day and it's on my homepage, remember that. Um, so I look forward to uh, speaking with you and I thank you for the trust and confidence you place in me by listening to this video and sticking through it for 33 and a half minutes. Thank you.